Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 2. It's in the Old Testament, one of the largest books in the Old Testament. And today we're going to talk about, take a broad look at the last days. History is his story. It is God's story. And history as we know it is coming to an end. You say, when? We don't know. But God began all of history when he created the heavens and the earth. You can read about that in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. But God will also consummate history at the end of the last days. This year at Bellevue Baptist Church, Lord willing, we're going to preach through the book of Isaiah. Now it has 66 chapters. So there's no way that we could ever cover every chapter, even every verse, but we will cover many verses of very much importance to all of us, and they'll be very applicable to all of us from the wonderful book of Isaiah. And I can't wait. I'm excited about this. Today, we're in Isaiah chapter 2. It's very interesting. A couple of weeks ago, the last time I preached here, uh, my wife and I had COVID last week, and so couldn't be here, but, uh, and we're doing fine. Everybody's great. And, uh, but the first week, I preached about whiter than snow and that the Lord will make us whiter than snow through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, it's snowing. You know, about the time you think we've seen everything, something else shows up around here. But you know what? God is on his throne, and we're grateful for that. But I want to talk to you today about the last days Isaiah chapter 2. Now, before we look at that, I just want to say that at Bellevue, we believe in six major last day end time events. I want to give those to you so it'll be a little bit of a framework so you can understand what we're talking about today. The first end time or last days event that we believe in at Bellevue is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is when Christ comes for his church. The rapture could take place at any moment. Nothing else has to happen for Jesus to come back for his church. In fact, Jesus said we are told to watch for it. Now, the rapture will be a snatching away. Let me read to you from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Just look there on your screen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That is, people who have died that know Jesus, their bodies will rise. Their soul and spirit already with the Lord, but their body, a resurrected body, is going to come out of that grave. As the old song says, ain't no grave going to hold my body down, and that body's coming out. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up there's the word for rapture right there. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so or thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the, the rapture is going to be a snatching away of the people of God. It's also going to be a sudden separation. Jesus talked about it in Luke chapter 17. And he said, this is what it's going to be like in the rapture. Verses 34 through 36. Again, look on your screen. I tell you, on that night, you say, will it be at night? Yes, on one side of the world, and it'll be daytime on the other, all right? On that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, now listen, and the other will be left. Can you imagine? Can you imagine going to bed with your spouse and waking up, and they're gone, and you're still there because you don't know Jesus Christ? That's exactly what he's talking about. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken. The other will be left, two people at work, grinding, working. All of a sudden, you look over, and the person's gone. What happened? The rapture. Jesus came for his church. And then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. That's the rapture of the church. Christ is coming for his church, and we're going to be caught up. It's going to be a sudden separation. We believe that's the first end time event. It could take place right now before I end this sermon. Now, right after that is the second great last day's event, and that is the great tribulation. Jesus called it that, by the way. And that's when Christians will be in heaven. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 4, verses 5. They read from Revelation 5 a moment ago. And then non-Christians will be in the great tribulation on the earth. <clears throat> I'm grateful that Christians won't have to go through the great tribulation. We will go through tribulation, but not the great tribulation. 
Christians will not go through the wrath of God, and the great tribulation is the wrath of God. And so I believe that Christians will be spared from that. But while we are in heaven, the Bible says non-Christians will be on this earth in the great tribulation going through a terrible time. After the rapture, during the great tribulation on earth, Christians will be in heaven and uh, will be there for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We read about that in Luke chapter 12, verse 37, the servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he himself will seat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit down and eat. Jesus is going to serve us a meal. For seven years, we're going to dine with the Lord, and we're going to eat the bread of life, and we're going to have a wonderful time with Jesus there in the heavens. And the Bible talks about it also, almost at the very end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. I am invited because I know Jesus Christ. Not because I'm a preacher, not because of anything else, but because I know Jesus and he saved my soul. And I have an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where I'm going to be during the great tribulation. But the great tribulation will also be a time of great distress. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 talks about it. Daniel saw the great tribulation, and he says, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, that is the great angel, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress, such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. There's going to be a time of distress on this earth. Jesus called it the great tribulation, and it's going to be a horrible time. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 6 all the way through chapter 18, and it is some of the most horrific things you'll ever read about in your life, and it's really coming. It's on its way. And while we're in heaven, that's what's taking place on earth, a time of great distress. Also, unprecedented suffering. Joel chapter 2 verse 2 says, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the dawn is spread over the mountains. So there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there ever be again after it to the years of many generations. So that's the great tribulation. Now Jesus gave the great tribulation its name in Revelation, or Matthew chapter 24 verse 21. Jesus talking about the end of time. That's what the whole chapter of 24 in Matthew is about. For then there will be a great tribulation, a mega tribulation. The word great is mega. Such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. It's also going to be a time of hardened hearts. We read this in Revelation chapter 9, 20 and 21, that during the great tribulation, even during the great tribulation, lost people will not repent most of them will not. Look at verse uh, on the screen there, Revelation 9, verse 20 and following. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons or the idols of gold or of silver or of brass or of stone or of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. They will not repent. People's hearts are going to be hardened during the great tribulation, and they will shake their fist at God and say, I hate you, Jesus Christ. Can you even fathom that? Well, people do that today. People even do that today. So it's coming. Third great end time event, last day's event, is Christ's second coming accompanied by the battle of Armageddon. Christ's second coming and the battle of Armageddon. Those are simultaneous. And we read about them in Revelation 19, verse 11 and following. Now, let me just remind you, the rapture is when Jesus comes for his church before the great tribulation. But the second coming of Jesus, the parousia, is when Jesus comes with his church after the marriage supper of the Lamb, with his church at the end of the great tribulation. All right? Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, John said, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. 
Oh, this is Jesus now. His eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, that's us, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, that's the Word of God, so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God. Now this is Armageddon. So that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him. That's Jesus who sat on the horse and against his army. And here's the, here's the, the anticlimactic Battle of Armageddon. And the beast was seized. Antichrist was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. What a picture. The battle of Armageddon. When Jesus comes back with his saints, wow. Then the fourth event of the last days, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. We read following after those verses in Revelation 19, in Revelation 20, verse one and following, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss, and that's hell, and a great chain <coughs> in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that's the devil, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, shut it, and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and, set, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus. These are the martyrs who died during the great tribulation. And because of the word of God, and those who had not worshiped the beast, that is the Antichrist or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now I could talk all day, <laughs> I'm sure you're, you're aware of that, but I, I could talk all day about any one of these events. And this event is when there's gonna finally be peace on earth, goodwill toward men, and not until then, not until the millennial reign of Christ, will there be peace on earth? And then fifthly, after that, there will be the final judgment. That's another event of the last days. We read about that. Continue if you'll read right on in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 and following. When the thousand years were completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Now, he's going to be released from prison just to be imprisoned again and put into hell. And will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain on the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and beloved city, the beloved city, that's Jerusalem. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them, now listen, was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. Don't ever forget, the devil is on his way to hell. Hell was created, Jesus said, for the devil and his angels. That's the fallen angels that went with him and became demons. And the Bible says that they came to that broad plain and, and uh, came, they came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast, that is the Antichrist and the false prophets are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell is not something, it's not soul annihilation, it is eternal punishment. They will to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, him who sat upon it, 
from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. No place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And then verse 15 is one of the saddest, most sobering verses in the whole Bible. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I want to stop and just ask, is your name in the book of life? Do you know Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? I remember talking to a friend that I went to high school with just a few years ago. He had cancer. I knew he was about to die. And I drove to my hometown of Dyersburg to talk to him. And I wanted to know that he was saved. I won't tell you his name, but I asked him, I said, do you know the Lord? And he looked at me and he said, yes, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And he was trembling, but he knew he was saved. Do you know that? Do you know for certain that if you were to die, you'd go to heaven? Do you know for certain if you were to live tomorrow or live today, that you'd go to heaven? If your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you will go to hell. Jesus says so. The Bible says so. God doesn't want you to go to hell. God wants you to go to heaven. Come to Christ today. Come to Christ during this message. And then, after the final judgment, there will be the new Jerusalem. That's the final last day's event. I'll just read eight verses out of Revelation 21. And then I'll start my sermon, all right? All of this is just prelude, all right? But the sermon will be quick. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven, praise God, and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. This world is going to pass away. Your garden is going to pass away. Your beautiful home is going to pass away. All your dresses, all your suits, all your jewelry, all your bank accounts, all your stuff is going to be blown away. The first earth is going to pass away. There is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. And by the way, have you heard how many times the Bible says that heaven is loud? If you don't like shouting, if you don't like praising God, you probably don't need to die because they're shouting in heaven. And they're also screaming in hell. Heaven is loud with the rejoicing and praising of God. And the Bible says... I saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among them, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and they, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hallelujah. And there will no longer be any death. No longer be any death. Praise God. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things will have all passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. Very much like what he said on the cross. It is finished. It is done. Paid in full. It is done. I'm the Alpha. I'm the Omega. I'm the beginning. I'm the end. I'll give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the immoral persons, the sorcerers, the idolaters, all the liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now let's look at Isaiah chapter 2. And what it's talking about are events that will take place during the millennial reign and the final judgment. You can put that in the brackets that I gave you there. I want to talk to you very quickly about Isaiah's vision. I mean, right at the beginning of his prophecy, he prophesies about the end of time in chapter 2. And he gives us three prominent statements about the last days. First of all, in the last days, Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Jerusalem. Have you ever wondered why in the world, every time you turn on the television almost, you can't go a week without hearing about Jerusalem. Why is that? You ever been to Jerusalem? I've been 15 times. Not trying to brag, but I've just been over there. And I want to say this to you. Israel is a very small little place. It's not even as big as Rhode Island. I've been to Rhode Island. <laughs> but it's very tiny. 
So why is it that Israel is so prominent? Why is it that Jerusalem is so prominent? Because it's the city of God. It literally has eternal ramifications, and it's going to be the capital of the world. In Isaiah chapter 2, the first four verses, the prophet Isaiah saw this beautiful picture of the end time during the millennial reign of Christ, after the rapture and the great tribulation, Jesus is going to come back, as we said, with his church on his white horse. We'll be on white horses as well. I don't really like horses, but I guess I'll like one that day. But we're going to be on white horses, come back with Christ, and for a thousand years we're going to reign with him on this earth, an unprecedented time of peace. There will never be peace on this earth until that time. The United Nations has not united the nations, all right? Only Jesus can do that. When he comes at the end of the great tribulation, Christ is going to come, and Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Look there in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 and following. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now will come about that in the last days, there it is, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Some people believe that God will actually literally, physically raise up Jerusalem. I don't know if he will or not. I personally believe it's just being raised. That's a figurative of speech there, but it's going to be elevated politically. It's going to be elevated spiritually. It might even be elevated physically. That's no no problem for God whatsoever. And it will be raised above the hills and the nations will stream to it, the Bible says. And many peoples will say, and I love this, they will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I learned that as a song right after I got saved in, in college. Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of our God. I won't sing the rest of it, but I, I, that just is so pretty to me. The psalmist also, Jerusalem, said also that it's going to be the capital of the world. Read that in Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. But as for me, God says, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. The king is going to reign in Jerusalem. Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet, also prophesied that Jerusalem will be the capital of the world at the end of time. Read that in Zechariah 14, verses 3 and following. Then the Lord will go forth, fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Where did he go? Where did Jesus leave this world from? The Mount of Olives, right there in Jerusalem. Where is he coming back? Right where he left. (laughs) The Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half the mountain will move toward the north the other half toward the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. That's the second coming of Christ. In that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle, for it will be a unique day. The, the, the time of, of the, the coming of Jesus and The millennial reign will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. I read this morning in my quiet time at the end of Ezekiel about those living waters that Jesus promised in the Gospel of John to that woman at the well. And now he's talking about it here. Living water is going to flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. And it will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one. And his name the only one. All the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. People will live in it and there will be no longer a curse. There will no longer be a curse for Jerusalem will dwell in security. That's why Jerusalem is talked about so much. It's going to be the capital of the world. I want to say this to you. God loves the nation of Israel. It's where Jesus lived. It's where Jesus ministered. 
It's where Jesus preached. It's where Jesus died on the cross. It's where Jesus rose from the dead. It's where Jesus ascended to heaven. And it's where Jesus is coming back after the great tribulation in the second coming of Christ. And Jerusalem and Israel, Christ will reign there in peace for a thousand years. No more elections, praise God. No more of that. We'll talk more about that momentarily. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world in the last days. The second thing that Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 2 is not only that Jerusalem will be the capital of the world, but he also says that Jesus will be the king. Jesus will be the king of the world. Look at verse 4 in Isaiah chapter 2. And he, talking about Jesus, will judge between the nations. And Jesus, if you will, will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares. As the old song said, ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. And never again will they learn, or literally, they won't study how to engage in war. It's a picture of Christ's rule during his great millennial reign. And the Bible says Jesus will reign exclusively. We go back to Zechariah verse, chapter 14, verse 9. The Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one, his name the only one. I'm looking forward to that. No more Republican and Democratic parties, praise the living God. No more despotic nations, China, North Korea, Afghanistan, Iran, and on and on. No more CNN network, no more Fox News, no more partisan divisive politics. Jesus will be king. I, lo I love this verse. I'm going to share with you out of Isaiah. I'll probably, I'm sure I will preach about it in the days to come. Isaiah 33, verse 22, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. And guess what? He's also our savior. He will save us. Oh, there's coming a day when Jesus will reign exclusively. No, he won't have a cabinet. He won't have anybody that can tell him what to do. Jesus is not going to be told what to do. Jesus is going to tell everybody what to do. And it'll be the right thing because he is the son of God. Jesus will also reign absolutely. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 2, we read about this a moment ago out of Psalm 2, verses 11 and 12, worship the Lord with reverence, rejoice with trembling, do homage to the Son, that he may not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Jesus is going to reign absolutely. You need to submit to Jesus even now. Daniel said in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus, was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, wow, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Jesus is going to reign absolutely. Revelation 19 tells us that. Verses 15 and 16, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I want to say this to you. There might be a king that you know about, but he's not King of Kings. Only Jesus is King of Kings. There might be a Lord you know about, but he's not Lord of Lords. Only Jesus is Lord of Lords. I want to say this to you. Greatest entity the greatest person is the divine person, Jesus Christ, in all the universe. Bow before him, receive him as Lord and Savior. And then Jesus will reign righteously. Isaiah 11 says, and then a shoot, that is a little sprig, will spring from the stem of Jesse. And a, that's the, the father of David, by the way. A branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. This is talking about Jesus. The Spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, 
And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness, the belt about his waist. Won't be long, we'll be celebrating. This weekend we're celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. And he quoted a lot of times an Old Testament verse. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. That came straight out of an Old Testament prophecy. And I want to say this to you. Amos 5.24 is what he was quoting. And that's going to be fulfilled at the time of Jesus coming when he reigns on this earth. Jesus will make sure that justice flows down like waters and righteousness. Because he's the righteous king. Righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Jesus will reign also peacefully. We go on in Isaiah 11, verses 6 through, five, and through 9. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. Now, you know what? Wolves don't dwell with lambs peacefully. They like to eat lambs. And lambs obviously don't like wolves, but they're going to dwell together in this time of peace. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling will lie together. And a little boy will lead them. Also, the cow And the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child, a little bitty baby, a little toddler, will put his hand on the viper or the cobra's den. Now, you know, that wouldn't be something you'd normally do with your little toddler. Uh, uh, Johnny, go play with the cobra. No, you don't do that, do you? But in the time of peace, you will. And the Bible says, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I love that verse. There's coming a time where the whole world is going to be blanketed with the knowledge of the Lord. Jesus shall reign where the sun doth its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more. To him shall endless prayer be made and praises throng to crown his head. His name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice. Let every creature rise and bring the highest honors to our king. Angels descend with songs again and earth repeat the loud amen. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. He's going to reign. He's going to be the king of the world in the last days. In the last days Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Jesus will be the king of the world. And one more thing. In the last days God will be the judge of the world. Now, we're just going to read through verses 5 and following. Many people believe that God is never going to judge sin or sinners. They're wrong. Look at verse 5. Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with influences from the east, and they are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. Their land has also been filled with silver and gold. There's no end to their treasuries. They were getting rich off of idolatry. Their land has also been filled with horses, and there's no end to their chariots. They've got all this stuff. Their land has also been filled with idols. They worship the work of their hands, which their fingers have made. They worship what they made rather than the God who created everything. That's idolatry. And then it says... The land has also been filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land has also been filled with horses, and there's no end to their chariots. Their land has also been filled with idols. They worship the work of their hands, that that which their fingers have made. So the common man has been humbled, and the man of importance has been abased, but do not forgive them. Enter the rock. Hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord. Hide from this Lord that's going to send justice and judgment, and from the splendor of His majesty. That's for sinners. The proud look of man will be abased. The loftiness of man will be humbled. And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning. A day of reckoning. A day of judgment. Against everyone who is proud, lofty. Against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. If you rise up before God and exalt yourself before God, he will humble you. And it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, against all the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against the ships of Tarshish, against all the beautiful craft. The pride of man will be humbled. The loftiness of man will be abased. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols will will completely vanish. Men will go into caves of the rocks 
and into the holes. We read about this in the book of Revelation. Of the ground before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. When he arises to make the earth tremble. In that day men will cast away to the moles and the bats. They're going to be in caves. So they're going to give all their idols to the moles and the bats while they're in the caves. They're idols of silver and they're idols of gold which they made for themselves to worship. Oh, they treasured these idols, but now they just give them away to random animals. The Bible says, in that day, men will cast away the moles and the bats, their idols and silver, their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the, cl- of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? Why should we be afraid of people that will absolutely have no strength whatsoever in the end of time and don't really have any now compared to God? The fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. You fear God. Oh, respect and be kind to men, but don't fear any human being who dies. He's like the grass of the field that dies, the Bible says. But our God is who we need to fear. Our God is the one we need to fear. Isaiah said that just as Israel sinned, even so in the future, prior to Christ coming in the rapture, people will sin greatly against God. That's what we're going through right now. I believe that we're experiencing what Paul, the Apostle Paul, saw when he wrote to second, in 2 Timothy 3. He said, Realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Say that, the last days. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness. Oh, they go to church although they deny its power. They don't believe in being born again. They don't believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in being set free from demonic strongholds. They don't believe in growing in grace. They don't believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God. They just go to church, but they deny the power thereof. They hold to a form of godliness. Avoid such men as these. Dr. Rogers was fond of saying, it's getting gloriously dark. And I want to say this to you. Before things get better on this earth, they're going to get a whole lot worse. All of that sin is going to end to the, in the judgment of God. We read in Romans 2, verse 16, On that day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Are you ready to stand before God? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For when we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. If you're a Christian, your works are going to be judged. That is, you're going to be judged for the quality of the works that you have. If they're gold, silver, precious stone, they'll pass through the fire of God's judgment. If they're hay, wood, and stubble, they'll burn up. Oh, you'll get into heaven but your, ju- your judgment will come against you on your works and you won't be as rewarded as much. But I want to say this to you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you'll be judged eternally in hell. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are they who find it. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the door. And the Bible says if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Are you ready? God's going to judge the world. Now you say, well, what can I do, Pastor, as a Christian? What can I do? I'll give you three things and we'll close. As Jesus is coming back, Isaiah 2 tells us that. Number one, we need to be working. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business, 
working with your own hands, just as we instructed you before, then people who are not Christians will respect the way you live and you will not need to depend on others. Work in the kingdom of God and don't be lazy. Be a diligent person. Also, witness. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 8. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept saying, Lord, has the time come for you to be to free Israel and restore the kingdom? He said, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times. Don't you worry about all that. That's not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Don't just sit around and study eschatology. Don't just sit around and study the end time events. No. Tell somebody about Jesus. Win somebody to the Lord. Work and witness and then wait, or watch rather, watch. Mark 13, however, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. And since you don't know when that time will be, be on guard, stay alert. The coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work which they were to do, and he told the gatekeeper to watch, the gatekeeper to watch for his return. You too must keep watch. Are you watching for the coming of Christ? Are you working? Are you witnessing? Are you watching? Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear now is at stake. Humble your hearts to God. That say is from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod. Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon. Morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. All the dead shall rise. Righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies. Heavenward bound. Are you ready for the coming of Christ? Are you ready for the rapture? If Jesus came and called his people out right now, would you go with them or would you be left behind? I'm as serious as I can be. If you don't know Christ, would you pray to receive him right now? You say, what must I do? Repent, turn, ask God to help you turn from your sins and turn to God. Ask him to forgive you for your sins. He's a gracious God. He will forgive your sins no matter what you've done. But you must repent. If you don't repent, you perish. Jesus said so in Luke 13. And then you've got to believe. You've got to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. You've got to believe that he paid this debt for your sin on the cross. And you have to believe that God raised him from the dead. You've got to believe that Jesus is alive. You've got to repent and you've got to believe. And then you've got to receive him. As many as received Jesus... To them, he gives the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Would you do that right now? If you'd like to do that, I would just love to lead you in a prayer of commitment where you can do it right now. You know, Billy Graham led in these kind of prayers. I like to lead in these kind of prayers as well. Just bow your head and your heart before God and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to be ready for the end of time. And even if it's a long way off, I want to be ready for death. And even if that's a ways off, Lord, I want to be ready to live for you today. Lord, I humble myself. Jesus, I repent. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Forgive me for my sin, O Lord. And Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for me. You paid my sin debt. I believe that they buried you. But I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe you're alive. I repent. I believe. I receive you. I call upon your name. Holy Holy, holy, Jesus, save me right now. Wash me in your blood. 
Fill me with your spirit. Save me, Lord. Write my name in heaven in the blood of Jesus Christ. I give you my life. Thank you, Lord. If you prayed that, you can't hear it. I can't either. But I believe it. Jesus said that every time one sinner repents, heaven breaks forth in praise. <laughs> I believe some of you repented, and I believe heaven is praising Jesus right now because of your salvation. And we would love to praise the Lord for your salvation as well. We don't want anything from you except to try to help you. That's all we want. We're not hitting you up for money or anything else. We never ask for money. Well, that's, that's not what we're about. But if you just prayed to receive Christ, you should see on your screen that you can text the name of Jesus to 901901. And we're going to send some materials, some free materials to you to help you get started as you grow in grace. And now that you've become a Christian, what do you do next? Do that even now.